you connect with someone, then they're likely to have a, a human reaction. And empathy is one of the core things on which humanity is built. You tell the things that somebody else may not be able to say, telling the truth the way it is. As we lose trust in politics and politicians and justice, telling stories of the truth is very powerful. And we've seen this in spades on social media, right? A shutting down, distance, an empathy gap. It's one of the reasons we feel social media pushing us closer together, yet pulling us further apart. We're in a stage where technology has been turned against the people. The only icons we have on our phone are either thumbs up, thumbs down, and a heart. There is no umbrella for understanding, and most of the comments are hatred. One of the downsides of being on Facebook and YouTube with your messages and stuff is that there are people who offer all sorts of helpful comments. You know, they point out what a Neanderthal you are and what cage you should be put in for your lunacy. And, and they say it in some really eloquent and, and direct ways. And, and the sad thing about this is that you can't, because it's almost always anonymous, you can't go to the person and say, hey, I'm sorry, what did I do that offended you? <laughs> why, why are you calling me all these names? You can't do that. And that's tragic in a way because, but I think about that person is just nursing that hostility. to be that angry to ventilize, ventilate that so powerfully. And I mean, sometimes it's kind of easy to get over it because it's so ludicrous when people tell me that they can tell by my hand gestures that I'm sending secret signals that the Masons are reading. <laughs> I can't run and chew gum, much less teach and make signals. I mean, it's just kind of, it's kind of easy, you know, to, to get past some of that stuff, and you realize that these are people who really, really have some serious issues with life. So there are times where it's, there's nothing you can do about it, but there's other times when you know there's stuff you can do about it. And what we fail to recognize in those moments is what we're suffering from is largely a self-inflicted wound. Technology isn't killing our empathy, though. We are. We are. And we really need to reinvent it. And we're allowing social media to hand us the loaded gun because, well, we're not being offered any alternatives. Well, the search for a missing YouTube star ends with the confirmed discovery of his body found in the water off lower Manhattan nearly a week after he threatened self-harm. It's, it's, it's happening uh, too often and it's reached the record high. So this is uh, uh, for public awareness that needed to know. Just think the internet has become such a toxic, negative place. It's getting worse, too. I mean, there's parts of the internet that are really great, and it's cool to see some people using their followings for, like, positive things, and I know you can get great messages out on the internet, but there's also just a lot of negativity. People spend way too much time on the internet including me, and it's just bad. Lots of comparison. It's crazy to me that people that don't know me at all will type paragraphs acting like they know my life and know better than this other person that doesn't know me either. I don't know. I just really wish the internet wasn't at the place that it's at now. We realize that focusing on technology is not enough. We need to focus on the people behind it. People give technology its meaning. It's just a tool. And the heart of the digital revolution has always been about how technology is affecting us collectively. I had an amazing mentor, an acting coach and a published writer whose name was Anthony Abeson. And he always said, our job from forever as actors has been to render each other more human by virtue of our own humanity. That's not just true of actors, it's true of everyone. We all need to render each other more human by virtue of our own humanity. He was best known for playing and reviewing Nintendo games. He had thousands of followers since joining the online platform in 2012. In fact, at one point, he had 800,000. In his last video posted before he disappeared, he expressed suicidal thoughts and apologized to fans. The NYPD says his body was pulled yesterday from the East River off of Pier 16 in Lower Manhattan.
I don't even know what the word is for it, but it's just, it's just very, very chaotic and hard for a human being to deal with. Up until we had the internet, nobody lived like this. The world has never been like this, ever. And this is not what a normal human being was created to go through. Have you ever noticed that if you're searching online for something, say, I don't know, a camera, suddenly that camera will show up all over your social media feeds? Or if you haven't spoken to or interacted with a friend online for a while, suddenly their presence will disappear from your feed? Have you ever wondered why? It's because social media feeds into this empathy gap. It emphasizes it with algorithms that cater only to the things that we like and isolate us from the things that we don't like or don't know. And then to top it all off, it's built to be habit forming. So we get stuck in loops of bias information overload that never intersect. And the technology that was meant to bring us closer together actually limits our exposure and polarizes us. What a business is built upon is what it perpetuates. And with social media, it's commodification. That's what it is. And we champion these sites at the expense of our emotional well-being because we value the image of success. The second part that I really worry about is that the way they are manipulating the information system is addictive. It's really addictive. And there's a wonderful quotation from a, a, a famous uh, Nobel winning economist, Herbert Simon, who said, well, what are we losing with all the information that's getting up? What we're losing is attention. We are suffering from an attention deficit syndrome so that we cannot actually avoid the addiction. We, we want to sell as much as we can and we are manipulating people. Now we're seeing a process where the commons is being lost, it's being commercialized and controlled by a handful of plutocrats and plutocratic corporations. And note, they're all based in one country and in one part of the country. So we're seeing a colonization of what information we get. And they choose that. And that's a big controlling aspect of the loss of the information commons. What's happened with this technological revolution that we're undergoing now is we've seen systematically the emergence of the big five. The big five being uh, Apple, Alphabet, Amazon, uh, Facebook, and Microsoft. Now, between those five, they are dominating the information commons. As we all know, we all use it all the time. And you have to think about those five becoming the big imperial powers of technology. And in the last 10 years, they've bought up over 500 other firms. There's a potential competitor that emerges, they buy them up. And it enables them to dominate what information is supplied. We all know the billions of people who are, who are, who are accessing the information system. But of course, these big five are determining what we get, how we get it, and don't forget what we don't get. And they're doing it in a way that, that is imperial in ambition. In the book I quote uh, Mark Zuckerberg. And Mark Zuckerberg has injudiciously said, well, uh, Facebook is more like a government than a firm. Well, we have words for that in, in reacting to that. But of course they're correct because they're determining what information goes, how it goes, and then of course what they do with the data, our data. Now, our data are part of the commons. What you supply information, what I supply information, we are supplying information for free. They are turning the data that we provide into rentier income. Billions of dollars for which they are hardly taxed at all.
the fourth industrial revolution. It's a fusion of the physical, the digital and the biological world. It's changing not only what we are doing, it's changing who we are. It's really the notion of digital technology pervasively impacting every walk of life and every vertical industry on all parts of the globe. Whether it's information technology and the acceleration we see in artificial intelligence, a lot is happening. Society and how we're going to live is being defined right now. church is no longer relevant. It's filled with meaningless rituals instructed through a flawed ancient book with no real answers to today's problems. All I can say to that is what Jesus said in Matthew 24. He said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. When somebody tells me, well, the Bible's no longer relevant to today's issues, I want to ask the question, well, what issue in particular are you talking about? And I usually get a blank look because the person said that is not somebody who's ever really taken time to look. It's more relevant today than it's ever been in the history of the world. In fact, I don't know how people manage without it. The emotional experience is what storytelling is all about. The imagined experience. There's this really interesting connection between empathy and storytelling, and storytelling and technology. They've been connected since language was conceived. So there's this really interesting dichotomy between empathy and technology, where the link between the two is storytelling. Imagine a platform built with these ideals, with the intention of interconnectedness and curiosity, social media that incorporates the identifiable victim effect to make digital communication more personal, Profiles don't exist. Liking, commenting, friending, commodification, gone. Instead, our experiences are our profile. Because we believe that social media needs a push toward authenticity. Let's call each other or send personal messages instead of liking or sending emoticons. Because we can all shift social media and help everyone become more empathetic. And if we do that, we'll remember that loving, liking, and friending, they're more than just buttons. So that ultimately, for us to have a meaningful relationship with other people, there has to be a sense of tenderness or kindness and a, and a sense of compassion or mercy, not with certain people at certain times, but it becomes generally distinctive of how we interact with the world around us. And we live in a world that is so militated against that, and we're such an adversarial culture that we find that the blame game is so intense that we oftentimes have really absorbed those cultural characteristics so that our Christianity, instead of being something that speaks of his compassion and of his tenderness and mercy and kindness, really just kind of looks like another bar about that that we bump up against. We have so many reasons to be angry at life and the world around us. Sometimes that's what spills out of us rather than compassion. We just simply, as Paul warned, bite or, and devour each other and end up being destroyed by each other. That's such a chilling statement. But we just bite and devour each other until we destroy each other. Well, how exactly does the enemy get away with that? All he has to do is implant an idea in your mind. There is no plan B. It's not hard to see why koinonia is so rarely seen in the church today. It's not hard to see why. With G.K. Chesterton in his wonderful book called What's Wrong with the World, he put it up in simple terms. He said, the Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. First of all, over 16 times, he just simply says, love one another. <laughs> love one another. <laughs> and that, the word love there is pregnant with meaning. 
It's, and, and, and I don't need to tell you that love here is that agape love, that agapao, that, that love of that all consuming love. He says, I command you. 16 different times he says, and then he modifies a little bit by saying uh, four more times, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Serve one another in love. Make lo your love increase and overflow for each other. And then finally he says, love one another deeply from the heart. To love one another deeply. <laughs> he had to throw deeply in there, didn't he? <laughs> I'm good at loving people superficially. But to love somebody deeply, to, to really become that engaged in their life. But then he goes on 30 more times, and the list is extensive. Be at peace with each other. I get comfortable right at that point, or uncomfortable, excuse me. Honor one another above yourselves. Live in harmony with one another. Stop passing judgment on one another. Accept one another then just as Christ accepted you. Instruct one another. Have equal concern for each other. Carry each other's burdens. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgiving each other Speak to, no one, speak to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. In humility, consider others better than yourselves. Do not lie to each other. Forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Teach one another admonish one another, encourage each other, build each other up, spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Do not slander one another. And slander isn't, that's not forensic use there. It's talking about speaking in a way that diminishes the other person, even if it's true. God made us for this. This is why we, we gather together. This is why we group together. This is why the sociologist says we are social beings. It's because we're made for relationship. The problem is that sin has made that more challenging. No. Regardless of the reasons why, at the end of the day, We're left with one simple instruction, and that's to love one another. <laughs> to love one another. Darn it, that's hard.